This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, I'm going to apologise for the fact that I'm delivering this plenary sitting down. My wife this morning said, with your knee, I think uh, you should ask them whether you can sit. Uh, so that's uh, the reason I'm doing this in a slightly uh, unconventional form for a plenary lecture. The purpose of this lecture is to frame the subsequent discussions at this conference um, of London's wartime experience in the comparative perspectives of other wartime capitals. As such, I will not be saying that much about London itself uh, in this lecture. When framing this comparison, I decided to concentrate on the major imperial capitals. So I will not be considering Brussels, Bucharest or Belgrade, which means that one dimension of the urban um, and the capital city experience of the war will be missing, which is the experience of occupation by enemy forces. Uh, uh, Brussels for practically the entire war, um, from August 1914 onwards. Uh, Belgrade from the middle of 1915, uh, and in fact briefly earlier even than that. Uh, and then Bucharest in, in, from late 1916 onwards. So the experience of invasion and enemy occupation will be absent uh, from this paper. I'm also not considering three other European capitals, Rome, Lisbon and, and Sofia. Um, in part, that's due to the almost complete absence of any uh, readily available secondary literature on any of them. Um, but also in the case of Rome, which was the one I was tempted to consider, the realisation that it's rather anomalous as a capital city. Uh, it's in fact actually the third largest city in Italy in 1915, when Italy enters the war. It is smaller than both Milan and Naples which makes it, again, quite unusual as a capital city. And the peculiar nature of the Italian state, both in the presence um, of the papacy, at this time, of course, as they refer to it, the captive papacy in, in Vatican City in Rome during the war, uh, which is, again, anomalous with any other city in terms of a, a disputed sovereignty, uh, but also the degree to which, um, historically, the Kingdom of Italy unifies around the Kingdom of Piedmont and the degree to which Rome itself never quite, at this point, I think it changes a bit after the war, really feels as if it is the centre of political power. So that's why I left Rome out of the comparison. It's also a little bit of an issue of size, because it is significantly smaller than any of the other cities that I will be discussing. So, uh, the six cases I am considering are in order, in, of uh, reverse order of size, uh, Constantinople. Um, which enters the war with a population of around about one million, uh, including its historic suburbs. Vienna, uh, with roughly double this, a population of about two million. Um, now, again, Vienna, I think it is fair to describe as the capital of the Habsburg Empire, even though, of course, the dual monarchy gives something of a capital city status to Budapest as well. Um, but nonetheless, I think when people think of the imperial capital, they think overwhelmingly of Vienna. Then St. Petersburg, um, which has a population of around about 2.4 million in, 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 in Greater St. Petersburg uh, at the start of the war. St. Petersburg, of course, goes through the war under the alias of Petrograd, uh, having been renamed in the early burst of Germanophobia at the start of the war. It's probably fair to say that almost none of the inhabitants of St. Petersburg refer to it as anything other than St. Petersburg while the war is going on. Mm -hmm. um, Berlin, size greater again. Uh, inner Berlin, Berlinstadt, um, has a population of about 2 million in 1914, and the outer suburbs, which become incorporated to the, into the city at the end of the war, bring this population to around about 4 million. Berlin had been an extraordinarily rapidly growing city in the years running up and, and, uh, to, to the First World War. Uh, Paris is of a similar size overall. Um, there's around about a four million population if you put together the Ville and, 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 and the suburbs immediately around it. But of course, and this is a point I will be returning to on several occasions, London was in a class of its own. Uh, the administrative county has a population of about 4.5 million. Um, what we might call Greater London, slightly anachronistic, a population of around about seven. So, what are the commonalities and what are the differences between these cities in 1914? All of them are the imperial capitals of multi-ethnic empires. And this is, I think, an important start point. 
So even one that we may not think of in particularly cosmopolitan or multi-ethnic terms, St. Petersburg, um, has uh, a mosque uh, that was built and completed in 1913. Um, and uh, this is actually before either Paris or London actually have a mosque. It's quite a big and, and impressive building, actually. And, of course, have been produced um, to provide a place of worship for visiting dignitaries from the Russian Central Asian Empire. So it, it's serving an imperial purpose. As I say, all of them, I think, can be described as multi-ethnic cities. All of them, for example, except nominally St. Petersburg, have very substantial Jewish populations. Uh, for example, there are 53,000 predominantly Sephardi Jews um, in Constantinople in 1914. Uh, Petersburg probably does have a substantial Jewish population, but one which is to some degree a hidden Jewish population for historical reasons to do with expulsions of the Jewish population from the city in the late 19th century. Um, there are also um, substantial, what might be called internal minorities um, in all of these cities. Uh, fellow citizens who are perceived as being somewhat different from uh, the uh, indigenous core. So um, Paris has substantial populations of Bretons, of Basques, um, and also large numbers of, of, of Alsatians who had moved to Paris um, in the aftermath of, of, of 1870. And indeed, of course, famously, the brasserie of Paris are, are largely an Alsatian uh, importation. Uh, Berlin is a city close to Poland with very substantial Polish populations. Uh, the Irish, I need no further comment on as, as a large segment of the London population. Uh, there are Finns in St. Petersburg. Again, St. Petersburg is very close to the Finnish border. Uh, there are also other Balts. Um, uh, Vienna and Constant Constantinople are heavily multi-ethnic cities. Uh, in the case of Constantinople, it's even possible that ethnic Turks are a minority in the city in 1914. It's a city, of course, with a long-standing and very substantial both populations of both Greeks and Armenians. Um, Vienna uh, was the second largest Czech city in the world um, in 1914. Uh, a very substantial Czech population, but also uh, Polish population, and, of course, as we're all very aware, uh, a very uh, significant Jewish population. Having said this, I think it's probably the case that for sheer diversity, it is London that takes the crown. Uh, with so many uh, settler communities, including uh, both um, imperial and continental, continental European uh, minorities. Um, okay, talking of crowns, a second feature, which is largely a commonality of these cities, uh, which is the presence of monarchies. Now again, Paris is the conspicuous conception, um, but all of the other capitals have a dynastic presence either in or near the city, and usually actually both. If you think in uh, the case of Berlin, for example, that there is a, a, a royal palace in the centre of the city, but the, the larger uh, royal complex is in Potsdam, just immediately outside. One could say something somewhat similar about uh, St. Petersburg, uh, with uh, sort of famously the Winter Palace in the middle of the city, but actually the Summer Palace is uh, around the uh, outskirts of St. Petersburg. And indeed, one could make the same point about Buckingham Palace and Windsor, um, as the dual focal points, one near, one uh, actually in the city. Uh, the presence um, or non-presence of these dynasties would be incredibly significant in the war. Uh, and, of course, the, 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 the withdrawal of the Tsar to the front in the summer of 1915 causes all sorts of problems uh, in terms of uh, the legitimacy of the regime, the perception uh, that uh, the uh, monarchical regime um, in St. Petersburg and in Russia more generally is being run by the person who is referred to with no affection as that German woman. Um, uh, the, uh, the Tsarina, uh, which of course leads into questions about um, uh, the sense of the non-patriotic nature which develops in the war of the Tsarish regime. Um, as well as um, being uh, the sites of monarchies, the, these cities are also the sites of the national assemblies, the parliaments. Um, Again, um, this has been a, a feature um, of London, obviously, for a, uh, longer perhaps than any of the others. But um, by um, the start of the 19th century, um, the, uh, the Reichstag in, in, in Berlin is um, playing a significant role in German politics, uh, depending on the historiographical tradition people come from, the degree to which that should be taken serious, uh, seriously uh, varies. Um, the Duma, of course, is established as a, as, a, as a genuine force 
um, in Russian politics after the 1905 revolution, uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the, the the Austrian parliament um, is playing uh, an important role, although one that um, is relatively quickly uh, dispersed at the start of the war, um, and then reasserts itself, I think, as the, as the war goes on. Um, these sites of political significance then, I think, are something we can come back to when we're thinking about the, the, the trajectories and outcomes of the war for the different cities. Third point that I would say is a, is a commonality is that all of these cities are, in somewhat different ways, um, centres of industry and of working class uh, uh, life. Um, this is true even to a limited extent of Constantinople. Uh, where there is a, a, a development of a, of a degree of industrialization um, in the early 20th century and a, a movement away from being a com completely colonized economy. So, for example, there is tobacco processing has become quite a significant thing in, in the area of Constantinople uh, at the uh, start of the war. Uh, Berlin, of course, is a major manufacturing center. Um, and um, the presence of cutting-edge industries, uh, uh, things like particularly in the, the electrical industry where Berlin is, is taking a real lead with Siemens and AEG, um, give a real sense of industrial modernity uh, to Berlin. Likewise, St. Petersburg is one of the major industrial centers um, of the Russian Empire. Um, factory workers made up for more than 30% of the St. Petersburg wor workforce at the start of the war. And that actually increases somewhat as, as, as the war goes on. It's a major center of uh, the chemical industry, of the uh, metallurgical industry, as well as having a fairly substantial um, uh, sort of food processing and textile industry as well. Uh, notoriously, and this almost goes back to um, what I would think of perhaps as A-level history, there's a particular concentration um, in uh, St. Petersburg industry. These are large industrial units by comparison with most other places. And indeed, um, that concentration of industry um, in, in large workforces in Berlin um, and in St. Petersburg, I think, is rather different from the situation um, in both Paris and London, uh, where um, there's a tendency towards much smaller units of production um, and without these very large um, industrial workforces. But, again, in both Paris and London, there is, um, even before the war, and the war will accelerate this, um, an acceleration of what might be called second industrial revolution industries in the suburbs. Uh, so the presence of things like Citroën, for example, on, on the outskirts of Paris. Um, to some extent, in terms of the perception of working class life, um, Paris the sense of the dangerous classes had peaked at and around the era of the Commune. Um, there is perhaps, although the memory of the Commune is never too far below the surface in Paris, and indeed beyond the Commune, events going right the way back to 1792, I think there's some diminution of the fear um, of the dangerous classes of working class um, uh, violence in Paris by uh, the uh, period of the First World War. Likewise, I think it is at least arguable, even allowing for some of the incidents around about 1911 and indeed um, suffragette activity, um, that uh, the peak of fear of the working class in London is, is really in the 1880s, um, and that by uh, the Edwardian period there, there's some movement away from that. In the case of Berlin, it's further complicated by the fact that the, the city is very much a social democrat, a, a red city in terms of 1914 politics, but the, the SPD itself had almost been incorporated um, into the German political order. German socialists are very orderly people. Uh, I think this is what le leads to Lenin's famous crack about why it would be impossible to have a revolution in, in, in Germany, because uh, what would happen is that people would queue to buy their platform tickets <laughs> before taking over the railway stations. Um, and and, and all the, for all of the paranoia, and there is a real paranoia among, with the Kaiser and some of the, of the political elites about the fear of, of, of socialism, actually, to a very large extent, this, is, this turns out to be um, uh, you know, rather exaggerated fear. Um, in Vienna, of course, um, the, the, the issue of um, uh, the dangerous classes is also tied together a little bit with the issue of the sensitivities towards ethnic diversity um, in, in the city. Um, so that's a, a third feature of, of similarity between the cities. A fourth is the idea of the capital city's historical depth. I'm not quite sure how else to phrase this, but in a sense, their accumulated physical 
um, cultural capital in terms of you know, monuments, sites of worship, symbolic importance. Um, of course, of all of these cities, technically, London is the oldest. Um, its foundation even predates that of Constantinople. Um, but in fact, in practical terms, I think the sense of antiquity is stronger in, in, in Constantinople than in uh, any of the others. It's the one of the most ancient uh, monuments. Um, London and Paris, of course, also have this real, really strong sense of, 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 of more or less a millennia um, of uh, significant centrality in habitation um, and, 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 and um, uh, place in, in, in the national psyche. Um, Vienna, um, to some extent, is a, a little bit of a newer city in the sense that the Vienna that exists is very much the, the post-1683, the post-Turkish siege Vienna. Uh, but nonetheless does also have this feel of, 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 of permanence to it. The odd one out is, is Berlin to some degree. Um, now Berlin does have roots that go into, oh sorry, St. Petersburg of course is, is a new foundation of the very early 18th century, uh, but almost everything to, that, that sort of characterises um, uh, St. Petersburg had been in existence for nearly 200 years by the, by the time the First World War uh, breaks out. Um, the one that's slightly the odd one out is Berlin, uh, with its massive and rapid expansion, um, it's perceived even, I think, within Germany as a peculiarly modern city. I think the phrase Chicago on the spay is sometimes used. Uh, and, and indeed, I mean, having, having had a wife who lived in Chicago, I can kind of see <laughs> what, what they meant by this. Um, these things, I think, also relate then to the fifth point of commonality, which is the, the cultural centrality of these cities. Um, both in high culture and in popular entertainment. Um, so I think we immediately think, in terms of, of, of the world of the arts, of Paris and Vienna during this period, the Paris as, 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 as the sort of capital of, of modernist artistic innovation, the era as of Picasso and Legere, uh, but also, of course, the Vienna of, of, of Freud, um, and the idea that these are innovative centres. Um, but I think you could make the case that there's also very significant cultural energy in both St. Petersburg and Berlin as well. Um, Berlin admittedly hasn't quite achieved the sort of artistic primacy uh, that Paris has over anywhere else in France because Berlin is facing serious competition from Munich um, in, in the immediate pre-war period. Um, but uh, Berlin is certainly, I think, getting there. And in one area, of course, Berlin has absolute primacy, which is as a centre of scientific research. Indeed, Berlin, I believe, has more Nobel Prize winners than anywhere else in the world um, in 1914. Uh, and for things like theoretical physics, there's no question that this is, this is the place to be. Uh, what becomes the Max Planck Institute, uh, the, the, I think it's the Kaiser Wilhelm Center in Dahlhelm, um, is founded immediately before the, the First World War. I think even London, often seen as a, a much more culturally conservative place, is not immune to many of the sort of cultural excitements of modernism. Um, and again, it's worth remembering that it's, it's from London um, in the immediate pre-war period and Fred Carnot's uh, troupe that you know, the, the great first really great global star of cinema, Charlie Chaplin, um, uh, emerges. And I think you know, people have argued, and I think probably rightly, that there's something of, there's something of London that always retains with, with Chaplin, even through his career in, in, in Hollywood. OK, so that's setting very quickly, in fact, not as quickly as I hoped I would, the pre-war scene. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I, I'm going to try to involve, not to um, uh, um, uh, take too much of people's coffee breaks away uh, with the, the unfortunate late start. Um, what I think I would like to use as a sort of mechanism to pull this to, together is, is the idea of, of, of the wartime siege. Um, and the idea of how this manifests itself in the different cities. Um, none of these cities uh, was declared an open city in the course of the war. So all were subject to the possibility of attack. But the kind of pressures placed on the city vary significantly from one city to another. So um, let's just take us through elements of, of, of the differences of the sieges of the capitals uh, that occurred during the First World War. The first of these is the threat of actual assault. And the most directly and persistent, persistently threatened city was, of course, Paris. Uh, the physical proximity of German forces for most of the war, um, Clemenceau in his um, uh, L'Homme Libre, which later, later comes after censorship, L'Homme Enchant, uh, talks about the Bosch are in Noyon. You know, this is how close they are to Paris. 
Um, this proximity is there for nearly the whole war for Paris, but it becomes particularly acute in September 1914 and in July 1918. And this had major consequences because this proximity of the German army, combined with the memory of 1870-71, to 71, twice led to a major population flight from Paris. Uh, much of the urban bourgeoisie uh, runs away uh, as the German, basically anybody who can afford to get out does. Uh, and then briefly, um, in the autumn of 1914, it's a crisis point in some ways for the city, and again um, in uh, the midsummer of 1918, um, Paris becomes predominantly once more a workers' city. Uh, and I think that's a, a, an interesting aspect of Parisian wartime experience. Constantinople also had to live with the prospect of attack in 1915. Uh, with Anglo-French forces, first of all naval and then combined forces, at the Dardanelles from February onwards, um, and staying there until December. And the very real possibility, which indeed was planned, of a supporting Russian attack on the Bosphorus. Um, this threat from Russia, incidentally, re-emerges briefly in February 1917. Perhaps even more dramatic as a, as a demonstration of the closeness of the war to Constantinople uh, was the sinking of shipping actually within the harbour on several occasions by British and Australian submarines in the course of 1915. So there is a real sense, at least in 1915 and arguably beyond 1915, that Constantinople itself might come under attack. And indeed, the, the Committee of Union Progress Government think about fleeing the city, at least if, the, if, if, if Ambassador Morgenthau is to be believed, um, in, in, in the summer of 1915. Uh, and indeed, again, Morgenthau suggests that everybody expected the city to fall. Um, you know, that, was, that was the wide expectation. Um, Petrograd um, experienced a developing threat in 1917 from late summer onwards as German armies and the navy begin to push along the Baltic littoral. Um, and indeed, um, after uh, the October Revolution, uh, one of the things that in, in, in the end forces the Bolsheviks to sign the, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk is the resumption of the German army's march on, 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 on Petrograd. Um, by contrast, um, and you can see how these the permeations are different from different reasons, and see this as, as I run through this. By contrast, Vienna, Berlin, and London were all reasonably remote from the threat of immediate attack, although London was not very far removed in distance from the battlefields of Flanders. Uh, and indeed, uh, when the wind was in the right direction, it was certainly alleged uh, that artillery firing could sometimes be heard in some of the, the southern suburbs. Uh, I don't know whether that's true or not, uh, but that's certainly the allegation uh, occurs. OK, so that's the threat of assault, but there's a very different picture in some respects that emerges when we think about bombardments. So, um, the first capital city to come under direct attack was Paris, which was raided by German Tauber aircraft in the first month of the war. Uh, Paris would experience its first Zeppelin raid um, in March 1915, which is more than a month before London, and would experience Gotha raids in the summer of 1917. In the spring of 1918, uh, these air attacks would be joined by the even more terrifying experience of shelling by the uh, 203mm Paris gun. Um, on Good Friday, the 29th of March 1918, a shell struck the Église Saint-Gervais uh, during uh, a service, killing 91 people. The worst single incident, I believe, from bombardment in any capital city. Um, Relative to population, Paris suffered perhaps slightly more deaths from bombardment than London, um, just over 500 from air raids and shelling combined. So relative to population, uh, it's very high, but it's experienced less in total numbers uh, than London does. Um, it also uh, experiences many less actual incidents, many less actual attacks. Uh, so it's a more intermittent experience in Paris. Um, and this was almost certainly, I think, for strategic reasons, because the forces dedicated for the defence of Paris, and apparently from quite an early stage, Paris is perceived by the Germans as a very tough nut to attack. A uh, lot of artillery, a lot of aircraft in the area. But of course, they could be there because they were not really being withdrawn from the Western Front in the way that forces defending London had to be. Um, London, therefore, I think, and I won't say too much about it because I know there's going to be quite a lot spoken about it in the next couple of days, I think was, as the direct target of a genuine strategic bombing offensive and a prolonged one, uh, in a unique position. Um, by contrast, the other four cities um, only experienced a fairly small level of threat. 
Um, I didn't know until I started preparing the paper, but uh, it turns out that Constantinople was intermittently raided uh, by both uh, British seaplanes and by the Russians uh, between 1915 and 1917, but with very few casualties. Uh, likewise, Vienna only really experiences one air raid, and it's a non-lethal one. Uh, in September 1918, uh, the Italian poet adventurer Gabriella D'Annunzio uh, launched a propaganda air raid on Vienna, but deliberately refrained from dropping bombs. Uh, he dropped poetry instead. Um, uh, although it's also mentioned in, a, in an accomplished leaflet that next time we might come back with bombs. And of course, this is right at the end of the, of the war. So it probably does cause a certain amount of trepidation, actually, in Vienna. Um, and of course the war ended um, too early for the British to undertake what they had been planning, which was to use the new four-engined uh, Handley Page 1500 bomber to mount air attacks on Berlin. Uh, this is in the pipeline. It would have occurred m no later than January 1919, but the war ends before it can be implemented. So that's the sort of picture on bombardment. Okay, a third feature um, uh, of the siege of these cities was the accommodation of refugees um, from, from hinterlands. Um, all of the cities would house refugee population for at least part of the war. Uh, and indeed, Constantinople was already housing a significant refugee population when the war broke out. Uh, displaced Turks um, from the, uh, the, the two Balkan Wars. Uh, and indeed, there had been an element of population transfer occurring, uh, particularly in, 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 in the first of those wars. Um, at the start of the war, Berlin sees thousands fleeing to the, uh, the city from East Prussia uh, in the first month, although it should be said that early German military victories allowed many of these early refugees to return home fairly quickly, uh, so after the battles of Tannenberg and the Masurian Lakes. Uh, less fortunate were the tens of thousands of refugees forced to flee from Galicia, um, Austrian Poland, uh, to Vienna in the wake of early Russian victories. Uh, in particular, of course, the Galician Jewish population who rightly feared uh, Russian pop persecution. And anything up to 100,000 uh, Galician Jews end up in Vienna and indeed in, in, in other major Habsburg cities as well. Petrograd never faced quite such an influx as Vienna does uh, in the first year of the war, uh, but the great Russian uh, retreats of summer and autumn 1915 saw, uh, to use I think Peter Catchwell's term, a whole nation walking east. Um, the chaotic nature of the Eastern Front meant that these refugees were accompanied by epidemic diseases, uh, particularly typhus, and Petrograd experienced 60,000 cases of various epidemic diseases um, in the uh, autumn of 1915. Um, the refugee influx also changed the composition of the population in 1916, even though the authorities made a conscious effort to specifically disperse Jewish refugees, um, from, particularly from the Baltic states. But there was a significant increase in the number of Poles and Balts uh, living in, in St. Petersburg or Petrograd um, in 1915-1916. Uh, um, but again, Paris uh, was probably the city most profoundly affected by the refugee issue. Uh, it absorbed both Belgian and French refugees in very large numbers from the very start of the war due to its close proximity to the main battlefields. But in some respects, of course, Paris was well prepared to do so because the early flight of some Parisians from the city had freed up a certain amount of accommodation that refugees could then use. Um, uh, so um, rather like Petrograd, there's another I think, similarity with P Paris in that a lot of the refugees who came to Paris came from areas which had traditionally provided immigrants, migrants into the city. So that they're coming from what might be seen as a traditional hinterland, which means quite a lot of refugees, both in Petrograd and in Paris, are able to make use of family connections already within the city, I think. Um, London also took a trickle of refugees from the very start of the war, but it was the panic evacuation of Antwerp um, in September 1914 and into October 1914 that turned the trickle into a flood. Um, London remained, I think, central to the Belgian refugee experience in Britain, although Belgian refugees were dispersed all around the British Isles, including one Belgian police detective who ended up in Torquay, uh, where a young Agatha Christie may have met him. And nevertheless, London did remain the major centre uh, for Belgian refugees. Um, OK, fourth element of the siege, um, military enlistment and casualties. Um, even before the declaration of war, the cities in conscriptionist societies were profoundly affected by call-up. Um, Petrograd, for example, saw 138,000 adult males 
Call to the Colours between the 18th of July and the 1st of August, and there were relatively few initial exemptions in that city. <coughs> of all the cities, again, it's Paris which is the most mobilised. In the course of the war, it is likely that 880,000 men from the Department de la Seine served, a truly staggering figure, uh, suggesting that perhaps 80% of male Parisians of military age were in service. Of these, 123,000 were killed, and the majority of these may have died before the end of 1915. Uh, the comment by an American correspondent in 1915 that most Parisian women were wearing mourning might have been slightly exaggerated, but at the same time it does reflect a truth. By contrast, other cities are not hit quite so early, but, um, and we, we talked about this at, at some length in, in capital cities at, at war, most of the capital cities do seem to have relatively early high casualty levels relative to the nations in which they, they are placed. Uh, and we, we talk at some length of what the possible explanations of that might be. Um, overall, our conclusion on Paris, London and Berlin, and I think um, it's probably the case um, of um, uh, Vienna and Petrograd to some degree as well, um, is that the final death tolls for the cities are very slightly below the national averages from the countries in which they're placed. But it is close, and probably within you know, a, a statistical sampling margin of error. Um, what also seemed to be the case is that the uh, metropolitan death tolls seem to be strikingly a little bit older um, than those of the countries in which they're placed. Now, we came up um, with a possible explanation for this, which is that um, as war industry expanded, um, as the war goes on, um, the younger men in the metropolitan populations might get drawn into uh, war industry um, rather than um, enlisting. It's possibly not the case, um, but it was the only thing we could really think of at the time. Uh, so, um, uh, but it is quite striking, actually, when you get to 1918 in London, um, the co-mountain conscription um, yields relatively few people um, who are fit for frontline service. Quite surprisingly, no numbers, actually. So something weird is going on. Um, it's not, of course, just the, the death tolls uh, that represent the human cost. It's also the wounded. Uh, and a tangible reminder of the human cost was the presence in the capital of the wounded. Indeed, as early as the spring of 1915, uh, it suggested that 135,000 men had passed through Vienna's hospitals. Uh, in the course of the war, something like 300,000 wounded men are treated in, in, in the major uh, hospitals of Berlin. Um, and you can see similar examples uh, across the, the, the road. Um, one impact of this, of course, is that all of the cities are to some degree feminised in the absence of men away on military service. And, of course, again, it's one of the things of the cultural scene uh, which is widely observed in every city, which is you know, the presence of, of, of women substituting men in, in, in the workforce. Um, the obvious distinction between London and the other cities is the persistence of voluntary military service into the middle of 1915. Um, it does make a difference. Um, it does change some of the patterns of recruitment. But I think two qualifications should be made. One of them is when we talk about voluntary military service, we are talking about voluntary military service in a manner that's connected with a fair degree of what might be called social coercion. Uh, in other words, how voluntary is voluntary military service? <laughs> a point, of course, which actually becomes very imp important in public discourse um, in Britain by the middle of 1915. The second is that the capital cities, all of them, and I think without exception, um, also the other five, although they are conscriptionist societies, also see fairly significant volunteering movements. Uh, even Paris, which is probably the one which we think of it least, because it actually has quite a number of um, foreign citizens uh, who um, are not eligible for conscription into the French army, but many of them volunteer um, for the Foreign Legion and indeed for the, for the regular French army as well. Um, there are volunteers in St. Petersburg. Um, there are substantial numbers of volunteers in Berlin, uh, particularly um, 
Uh, well, again, there's a lot of argument about the social composition of the German war volunteers. There are volunteers in Vienna. Um, so, um, and, and even, I think, in Constantinople. So I, I think, again, we can, we can overdo the distinction between voluntary Britain, uh, voluntary London, and conscriptionist other cities. Um, it does probably mean that there's a bit more organised thought behind who's going and who isn't in the other cities. But even there, um, there's a degree of uh, rather chaotic call early on followed by a bit more systematic manpower policy later. Okay, how am I doing for time? I should probably try and keep this moving along fast. <laughs> um, I was going to talk about housing. Um, I'm probably going to skip across this quite quickly, except to point out that it's worse in St. Petersburg. Uh, St. Petersburg was notoriously overcrowded even in 1914, and it gets worse. Uh, and it's probably, although housing is an issue everywhere, it's in St. Petersburg where it most directly is an issue of the capital city itself. Um, so, for example, um, although Paris plays quite an important role in French uh, housing regulation and the moratorium on rents, Berlin likewise, but these are in, in some ways national issues. In the case of London, although there are protests about um, housing in, in the course of 1915, to some extent the Rent Act of 1915 is, is responding probably much more to much more militant um, housing agitation in other parts of Britain. Uh, but in St. Petersburg, housing is, is part of what becomes the general social crisis uh, running into 1916. Um, likewise, I have a little bit to say about wartime regulations, um, but I think I'm going to pass straight over it and move on to blockade and shortage. Um, the question of the provisioning of the civilian population um, was, from the very start of the war, seen as one of the most sensitive. But interestingly, the cities which suffered most acutely from shortages were not the ones which were the principal targets of blockade and economic warfare. Um, it is the first city where the food supply really breaks down is Petrograd, uh, which um, is caused not by economic blockade, um, because after all, Russia is taking itself to the food. Um, and indeed, um, the total food production in Russia if you take away the fact that Russia is no longer exporting food from 1914 onwards, there is as much food in Russia in 1917 What causes the breakdown is effectively the collapse of the civilian transport system by early 1917, um, and to a lesser extent, but still put some significance, the collapse of market networks. In other words, the peasants have food, but they're no longer very interested in selling to cities. Uh, and that's what causes um, a, a very severe uh, food crisis in the winter of 1916 and 1917. The role of those food sources in precipitating the collapse of the Tsarist regime is well known and documented. Um, uh, and uh, as basically inflation uh, in food prices and the erosion of living standards uh, produce a very specific collapse in 1917 with devastating results. But, of course, the provisional government proved no more capable of meeting this basic task of provisioning. Um, and, indeed, the inflated expectations um, after the February Revolution were themselves dashed by continued inflation. Vienna's food supply collapse, again, is not due to the economic warfare of its enemies as much as it is to the breakdown of relationships between the two halves of the Habsburg monarchy. By October 1918, the basic ration of Viennese citizens had fallen to 800 calories per day, uh, basically a level of not particularly slow starvation. Uh, and in January 1919, physicians estimated that 11% of deaths in the city were caused directly by starvation, and that malnutrition was a major contributor to a further 20 to 30%. So that's how bad Vienna is. And, and, and in that sense, Vienna, although it's, its crisis is later than St. Petersburg, is even more severe towards the end of the war. Um, but again, this is um, very largely due to the fact that Vienna in peacetime had been heavily reliant on food supplies from the Hungarian, the more agrarian uh, half of the, of, of, of the Habsburg dual monarchy. Those exports of food more or less cease by 1917. Now, this causes enormous tension and a lot of blame towards the Magia, um, uh establishment in Budapest, to which their counter-argument has never really been quite resolved, is, well, we were feeding the army. 
so that all of the food that we've previously been sending into the Austrian half is now feeding the joint combined army of, 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 of both sides, which is, again, true. Um, but um, whether this fully explains the degree of, 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 of shortfall in supply to Vienna is, is, is another question. Um, so Petrograd and Vienna suffered earlier and more severely, but Berlin uh, saw an intensifying sense of crisis from 1916 onwards. The first food right in Berlin is as early as October 1915, and police reports about food grumbles had become frequent uh, by the summer of 1915. But it was the turnip winter of 1916 that saw a real sense of crisis develop. Uh, food queues that lasted overnight became commonplace. The authorities did respond to this in part with communal feeding, but the soup kitchens were not popular. Uh, there's a considerable and ongoing academic debate as to whether the German authorities, including the civic authorities in Berlin, did as well as could be reasonably expected, considering the pressures that they faced. But there can be little doubt uh, that the demographic, demographic measures tell a grim story of rising mortality, particularly amongst the elderly, uh, and stunted school children. Uh, and again, um, uh, the loss of height for school children is about two centimetres on normal growth. Uh, by 1918 for the children of 11, which is pretty substantial. Um, it is also noticeable that in both Berlin and Vienna, by the end of the war, the middle classes were starting to suffer to a similar degree to the pre-war poor. Access to the black market had shielded them for a while, although at some psychic cost to their sense of self-worth, but by 1918, destitution and desperation were becoming widespread. Now, even if London and Paris were somewhat shielded from the near-apocalyptic breakdowns of the other cities, they shared a broad sense of deprivation and inconvenience. The food queue, in fact, was the ubiquitous symbol of wartime capitals. And at its height in London, um, which I think is the last Saturday of January 1918, the Metropolitan Police estimate that there are half a million people queuing for food. Now, it should be said that that was probably pretty much the situation throughout the last three years of the war, every day in, uh, in, in Berlin. Uh, but nonetheless, at its height, London does start to look a bit like the, the, these other cities. Perceived inequality was also a shared issue across the cities, although Paris moved quickly to fix the price of bread, uh, for obvious historical reasons. Um, inflation in 1914-16 sharply eroded Parisian working class access to meat and vegetables. Real wages in London did fall significantly behind food price inflation until the middle of 1917, but London had at least the countervailing benefit to some extent of significantly increased employment, whereas London was still suffering from at least some unemployment into 1916, extraordinarily. This is to do with the disruption of the, of, of, of the local economy through, through the invasion. Paradoxically, the modest improvement in working class purchasing power by the end of 1917 might have contributed to the growing length of the queues, uh, which in turn led to the introduction of formal rationing in London in, in early 1918. The other thing that probably should be said is, is a universal amongst the combatant cities um, is the issue of substitution. Although Parisians and Londoners never experienced the universality of the ersatz, uh, which is a, a central to the experience of Berlin and Viennese life, the sense that superior products were being replaced with inferior ones was widespread um, uh, so even in previously poor working class diets, so bacon replacing fresh meat, margarine replacing butter, and war bread um, everywhere, and was heated everywhere, although particularly, as one can imagine, in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just, of course, food supplies that mattered. Coal was also a critical issue. London suffers a serious uh, coal supply crisis in the winter of 1915-16. Uh, of, of um, Berlin's crisis is in the winter of 1916-17, and interestingly, the massive spike that occurs um, in the death rate of the elderly in Berlin may be at least as much to do with shortage of coal, uh, and therefore um, uh, loss of heating, as it is to do with malnutrition. Um, again, I could say more about that, but I do not have time. Right, pushing on. Enemies within. Uh, the fear of enemies within was apparent in all cities from the very outbreak of the war. The spy scare occurred with local variants in every city. It was largely, uh, but not entirely, irrational. Obvious targets for both espionage and sabotage did exist, and indeed it seems likely that British able, uh, agents were able, with local assistance, to organise the fire that destroyed Constantinople's main railway station and its munition depot in September 1917. 
enemy nationals were the most obvious target um, and tended to be treated badly everywhere. Um, Morgenthau, the American ambassador to Constantinople in 1914, does claim that the Turks um, were incited by the Germans to mistreat um, enemy uh, aliens, but he was writing after the American entry into the war against Germany. Um, his account of the looting of a French convent in November 1914 suggests a more complex story involving uh, elements of local animosity. Uh, in May 1915, the Turkish government sent 3,000 British and French passport holders, most of these Levantine, according to Morgenthau, uh, to the Dardanelles to be utilised as human shields against the alleged bombardment of Turkish villages. This deportation, which was strongly protested by the Americans, only lasted a week. In St. Petersburg, the German embassy, um, but also locally owned German business, had been attacked by mobs as early as the 22nd of July 1914. But subsequent mob violence against the German population was much less noticeable in Petrograd than it was in Moscow, and the mass deportation of German Russians was more noticeable in the southwest. But there was undoubtedly an escalating economic persecution with the confiscation of German property. The old Baltic German aristocracy was still largely protected while the Tsarist state lasted, but would face increasing persecution after the revolutions. Uh, in the end, in, in Petrograd, the worst was avoided or at least postponed, although the commander of the Petrograd military district, Mikhail Bonchbrovich, would write darkly about a final solution to Russia's minority problems in 1915. Uh, in Berlin, the number of enemy aliens was quite small, but there were ugly incidents towards resident Italians in the aftermath of that nation's treachery in 1915, including a, a very unpleasant incident where a school headmaster ended up slapping a young Italian girl in the face. Um, but um, subject and allied populations could also become focal points of hostility. The most murderous case of internal persecution was that of the Armenian population a community in Constantinople. Compared to the rest of the Armenian population in the Ottoman Empire, the population of the Constantinople got off relatively lightly. But nevertheless, from April the 24th, 1915, there were several waves of deportation of Armenian community leaders from Constantinople, perhaps 2,500 in all, most of whom were subsequently murdered. Other Armenians fled from the city for refuge in Bulgaria. But actually, overall, the Armenian population of the city remained largely intact through the war. Uh, perhaps to some extent protected by the foreign diplomatic presence. Uh, so it was much harder, in a sense, to implement genocide under the clear eyes of, of, of foreign diplomats. Uh, Vienna saw witch hunts directed at its minority populations. Uh, the police encouraged the population to denounce traitors, and Czechs became a prominent target. Even the proudly cosmopolitan Stefan Zweig managed to engage in a little light denunciation. Uh, one of my colleagues recently found his uh, thing where he denounced his neighbours to the police. Um, in October 1915, mobs of German factory workers attacked their Czech colleagues, and Czech patrons, including uh, parliamentarians, were driven out of a prominent Vienna cafe for speaking the language in 1918. And I think the persecution of London's Germans, of which we're going to hear much more later on, should be seen in this frame. Nevertheless, I think it's still probably the case that London has the dubious distinction of the worst foreign anti-foreigner riots of any of the capital cities, both in 1915 and 1917, although comparable, I think, to what happens in Moscow uh, rather than what happens in, in, in Petrograd. Okay, um, I'm very conscious uh, that we don't want to go too far into coffee, but I still have a few more things that I want to talk about. So, outcomes. Um, Revolution. Pre-war thinking amongst both radicals and conservatives had assumed that the pressures of war on hard-pressed urban populations could and probably would lead to the revolutionary overthrow of combatant governments. Yet in the end, there was only one clear case where this occurred, which is, of course, Petrograd in 1917. There are revolutionary dimensions to what happens at the end of the war in both Berlin and Vienna, um, but the three cases were significantly different. Petrograd itself was the incubator of both of the Russian revolutions of 1917, and crucially the Petrograd garrison and the Russian Baltic fleet were drawn early on into the revolutionary upheaval. The very proximity of such substantial armed forces ultimately became a weakness for the government in dealing with the already radicalised um, urban population. 
By contrast, the revolution was imported to Berlin by the arrival of the revolutionary sailors of Kiel. But, of course, when the sparks fell on the city, there proved to be significant tinder to ignite uh, from the years of deprivation and hardship and the increasing uh, disbelief um, in the government. Vienna, by contrast, perhaps never really experienced the revolution itself at the end of the war, but was simply, simply dragged into the wider collapse of the regime. The actual overthrow of the empire, I think it's probably safe to say, occurred more in Prague and in Budapest than it does in Vienna, and Vienna is more reactive uh, to events that are occurring elsewhere. Um, Constantinople, of course, saw a very different end to the war in the form of a significant military occupation. And indeed, the very future of the city was open to question for several years after the war, with Greece maintaining a historical ambition to absorb what was still in some respects the centre of the Hellenic world. And in the end, it was the success of Turkish arms that secured the Turkish future of Istanbul, and later Istanbul, uh, in conjunction with its displacement as capital city. Uh, and of course, the capital moves from Constantinople to Ankara. Uh, Paris and London, in this sense, operate in a more stable framework, uh, a framework which, in a sense, is underpinned and guaranteed by victory. Um, and that's, in, in some ways, why um, part of the story of these metropolises, in, 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 first of all, in November 1918 and then um, in, the, in July 1919, is the way they celebrate the victory, the way they celebrate the peace. Um, this leads into the question of post-war upheaval, um, and again, Four um, of these cities, um, at least briefly, um, well, so four of these cities ceased to be imperial capitals. Um, the threat of the German advance saw uh, the Bolshevik government decamp in early 1918 from Petrograd to Moscow, never to return. Um, Petrograd then also suffers from significant depopulation during the Civil War, uh, with continued shortages driving more than half of the population out of the city between 1917 and 1922. Uh, Turkey, I've already mentioned, and Constantinople losing its, its status as capital to Ankara. Berlin and Vienna remain capitals, but they are, I think, in the interwar period very much, in their, each in their own way, post-imperial capitals. Until, of course, in, in 1933, Berlin tries to re-establish some of its capital uh, imperial pretensions as capital of the Third Empire, uh, the, the Third Reich. Um, and, of course, Vienna, after the Anschluss, um, ceases to be a capital at all, uh, at least for uh, seven years. Um, which leads us into the question of the shadow of the Second World War. All bar one of these cities um, sees its First World War experience overshadowed by its Second World War experience. Um, five of the six uh, suffer more badly um, in the Second World War than they did in the First, and Istanbul, of course, is spared by its neutrality. Leningrad, of course, in the Second World War, as Leningrad as it has become, uh, uh, Petersburg as it's still being referred to by its inhabitants, I think, even at this time, uh, was encircled for 900 days and saw almost a million of its inhabitants starve to death, uh, caught between the murderous intent of the Third Reich and the negligence of its Soviet rulers. Berlin was reduced to rubble by first the RAF and then even more comprehensively by the Red Army and ended the war in an apocalypse of rape and suicide. Vienna suffered a slightly less lurid version of the same fight uh, in 1945. In some respects, you could argue that Paris fared less severely, declared an open city in 1940, and saved from destruction by the disobedience of its German garrison commander in 1944. But the psychic wounds of occupation, collaboration, and above all deportation would run very deep. Now, by contrast, London's experience of five months of relentless bombing during the Brits and further Blitz and further raiding and rocketing right into 1945 was more consistently lethal and terrifying than the experience of Paris, and yet at the same time allowed a memory of heroism and justification to be created. So in a sense, it's a, a huge contrast with the Parisian experience of the Second World War. These experiences have generally placed the First World War experiences in the shade, uh, but I think this is perhaps particularly true of London, where the First World War experience tends to be understood as a prologue uh, to the second, rather than as, 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 a, as an experience in its own right. And again, this is something I suspect people will be picking up on. So finally, conclusions. London shared many features of its war experience with other capitals, while remaining in important respects sui generis. Uh, as Stalin once remarked, quantity has a quality of its own, 
And London's scale, and indeed its relative size within the British Isles, was simply different from anywhere else. Uh, its sheer size and diversity may have helped it deal with the pressures of wartime siege, just in all sorts of odd ways. I mean, one, one little example of this is that um, Berlin is simply too built up uh, to allow people to grow much food in the city. Uh, whereas, of course, London becomes, you know, during uh, 1917 in particular, a kind of a city of allotments on a massive scale. And it can do this in London. There's space to do it. Uh, it isn't as dense. And it, it is more sprawling. But, of course, London's biggest advantage during the war um, is that it's able to maintain most of its global links, which provide a further cushion to the metropolitan experience. Uh, the ability of London to maintain its position um, as the capital of an empire, and all that that means in terms of resources, I think, is, is fundamental. Um, the strongest comparisons in many areas um, with London's experience, probably in the end, are with Paris, um, a point further reinforced by the fact that they come out of the war with a similar outcome um, in, in 1918 and 1919. And indeed, peace celebrations and commemorations um, in 1919 and 1920 and the two cities were strikingly coordinated. Um, uh, this is uh, true of, of, the, of, the, of the, peace per, uh, the, the peace celebrations in July 1919. It's also true of the internment of, of, of the, uh, the unknown soldier in Paris, the, the unknown warrior in London. These are coordinated events deliberately intended to reinforce the bond, bond between the two cities. And of course, unlike four of these uh, cities, but again, like Paris, uh, London did not experience regime change as a result of the war. So I think um, what I would like to suggest at, at the end of this is that there is value um, in these comparative frameworks in thinking about the London experience. It does bring to light some similarities and some major differences in that experience. But in the end, um, you know, Comparison only takes you so far. London is a bit different. Uh, and I think that might be a, a good point to stop and allow people <laughs> to have some coffee. I apologise that I overrun by about five minutes, but we, we started about five minutes late as well. So. Well, I think we, we just have a... Yeah. <laughs>